So uh, I've, had, I've had a few different opportunities. I remember when I was a college kid, me and a friend of mine were driving and we did, we were, we were, we'd visit my parents for Thanksgiving, and we're on our way back, and we're going to go to, we're going to, I think we just like said, all right, we're going to go, we're going to go to the third church we find on the eastern shore of Virginia. I don't know if you know that there's an eastern shore of Virginia. It's this little piece of land on the eastern side of the Chesapeake. There's about seven people that live there. All right. Well, somehow they, somehow we found this great little black church. And we got there right in time for Sunday school. They brought us to Sunday school. And then afterwards, like, we have special seats for you. And they brought me, me and my buddy right up front. And uh, we were clearly the new people at church. And we, it was awesome. We loved it. I, I, I want to do that again uh, uh, someday. Uh, I've had the opportunity to worship and, uh, and, and preach in a church in Germany. And I've had an opportunity and have obviously had it translated. And then I had a, a similar experience of doing that in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Let me tell you, two very different experiences going from Germany to Congo. But it was awesome. Different kinds of experiences. So uh, let, me, let me go ahead and read our passage for today. We're going to read from uh, a letter uh, from the Apostle James, chapter 2. My brothers and sisters... Believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there, or sit on the floor by my feet, have you not discriminated among yourselves? And become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him whom, of, to whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbors yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said you shall not commit adultery also said, you shall not murder. And if you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you've become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Because judgment not without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims that faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister was out clothes and daily food. If one of you says, go in peace, keep warm, well fed, but, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. So I've had two relatively common spiritual observations I've had for a while now uh, and they they kind of they kind of go together and they kind of work against each other first of all I sense people are hungry spiritually I sense people are asking questions that are, that are either spiritual questions or very close to spiritual questions people had this sense that if they succeeded in all the things that they think they should succeed in, it probably wouldn't work. And they also have an increasing sense that the, those who are an authority trying to figure things out are probably not going to get it right. People are asking spiritual questions, and they are hungry. And yet, also, they there's this in increasing distrust of institutions. The institutions aren't getting it right. There's a lot of changes, and they're not changing. Institutions don't change very quickly. And in particular, I see, we see that with the church. 
Uh, Rachel talked about how we got our name and, and how that was a little bit different. When we, were, when, uh, when we were thinking about our church, we recognized that at the time, depending on the survey, but around 90% of Americans uh, say they believe in God. And depending on who's measuring, somewhere between 15 and 30% of Americans actually attend church. Uh, so uh, people don't, most people don't have a problem with God. But they do have a problem with the church. Uh, in 2022, a podcast came out, a 15-session, a 15-episode podcast called The Rise and Fall of Morris Hill came out. And it, and it uh, told the story of Mark Driscoll, uh, whose gifts and charisma built a tremendous ministry in Seattle. And it was perfectly timed to hit the internet, and he became you know, sort of a na- nationwide sensation with his teaching. Uh, and yet, um, there was also narcissistic patterns in his, in his way of being that created a, an abusive environment around him. And the, the, the podcast wasn't necessarily trying to figure out what happened to Mark. The podcast was asking the question, what kind of environment allowed this kind of person to emerge? It was really intriguing for me because uh, Mark Driscoll and Mark Lucenius are around the same age. And if you would have asked me 15 years ago if I could trade my ministry for his, I would have. Uh, we grew up, so to speak, in the, in the church, reading the same books, going to the same conferences, listening to the same people. And so we sort of drank the same waters, you might speak. And so I was curious around this thing. And I've, it's not just Mark Driscoll. I've seen that pattern elsewhere. What was it about the church that continued to embrace and allow and enable this sort of situation to happen? I was curious about it. And uh, it's, it's not just this situation. Uh, there's other situations that have happened in the church, whether it's the, the abuse within the Roman Catholic Church or things that have happened in other denominational churches that have been well, well documented. Uh, people have questions about the church. In fact, uh, for, we, for our series, The God Questions, we took the five top questions that folks outside of the church have regarding the faith, uh, regarding what troubles them about the faith. And they've got, there's some intellectual things about science, but this one about the church, I think, might actually be the most important one because it's oftentimes experienced. It's experienced in the relationship, experienced in someone's heart. It's, and uh, in many ways, it, this kind of experience is the very thing that limits people from being able to get, well, get their questions answered. Why? Because the source of their questions are something that they distrust. So this God question that we're working through today is this. Uh, hasn't the church been a source of pain and suffering in this world. And uh, what, I, what I'm not going to do is I'm not going to uh, go through all the things that the church has, uh, the, the ways the church has made mistakes, and that we have made many. Uh, I'm not going to say, but, but the church has done this, 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 and this. What we want to do is we need to validate this. We need to say it's true. And we're going to take a look at the Apostle James and how he envisioned this very thing and how the church is supposed to live in such a way to protect ourselves from ever causing harm to anyone. So uh, four simple points. Point number one is this. It's true. The church has caused pain. I have seen it. I have received it. And I have been hurtful. Uh, whether it's the thing I wish I wouldn't have said as someone in authority, or the the or that that uh, structure within the church that I perpetuated that was good at this moment, but I kept it going even though it wasn't helping and actually hurting. I've been a part of it, and it is true. This passage 
gives us, in some ways, a beautifully simple case study. He's imagining a, a church gathering, maybe something very similar to this, with probably much less comfortable chairs uh, in the first century. Uh, and uh, a rich man comes in, he's got his gold ring on, he's got some good clothes. You know that this man has the ability to buy some clothes, and these clothes have been bought recently, and so you can tell this guy's a rich man, and everyone's like, oh, he's here. We got a great seat for you. And then clearly somebody who is not so rich or uh, a poor man who's got some dirty clothes and he doesn't get the good seat. And James says, oh, brothers and sisters, this can't be. This is clearly favoritism. The... The, as you read the book of James, he speaks specifically about the poor. He will even use a term like this. He says, God has chosen the poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith. Uh, you, you could even say it this way. The way a person responds to the poor and the marginalized in their life is a litmus test for our faith. What James was trying to address here is that he asked the question, when, when you engage in being a part of a church, when you, when you begin participating in the life of the church, is, is, it, is your participation in the body of Christ with Jesus, are you planning on and are you expecting on it, bringing you upward and, and inward when it comes to your socioeconomic status? the connections you get at church, you're going to get better connections in your life. You're going to get more people. You're going to get newer friends, better friends, better opportunities, closer to the center, more influence on something. Because James actually is going to encourage you if you read the entire letter, that says it actually works opposite. Following Jesus does not bring you upward and inward. It brings you downward and outward. It brings you towards the marginalized of society. If you follow Jesus through, his, through the Gospels, you, can see, you continue to see him moving away from the center out to the margins, away from those who get it to those who haven't gotten it. Those who have much to those who don't have it. You continue to see God move towards people who are poor in the eyes of the world. How do you respond to the people who are in the margins of your life? Is it, are you, is, do you have a natural inclination to maybe avoid the social outsider? the financial outsider, or maybe even the, the emotional outsider, right? This, po- this passage says, has not God chosen the poor? This is a really strong statement. This is a really strong statement. Uh, now, communists came in and they made a whole big thing about this. It's not that, okay? But it's in our poverty that we experience the richness of our faith. And why, what does this mean that God has chosen the poor? Well, he empowers the poor. Let's just, just imagine somebody is poor. Uh, they're generally not invited into things. They're generally not told that they have a purpose. They generally feel like they're on the outside of things. But the gospel comes to those who are poor and says, you matter. Your life matters. You have a very specific purpose. And you need to step up to live into that purpose because you are loved. You are cared for. You are part of a family. And who you are in that family matters to the family. And and who you are matters to God. That's absolutely absolutely empowering to someone, well, who has never been really very empowered. It it empowers the socioeconomic poor. It empowers someone who might consider themselves an emotional outsider. 
uh, you, well, I don't know where the percentages of, of Americans who are struggling with mental health, but generally speaking, when you are experiencing whether anxiety or depression, what you feel is that you are alone and that you don't belong. Messages of shame are sweeping over your mind and you are set aside. And God says, right there in your depression, in your anxiety, you matter. You don't have to get outside, get out of your anxiety. You don't have to get out of your depression to experience God. No, you can experience God right there. You can be rich in faith in the middle of your panic attack. You can be rich in faith in the middle of your sadness. You don't have to become unsad to experience God. No, he wants to come there right there and validate that sadness. You don't have to put on a smile to experience God. Socially, you don't have to get to the inside to experience God. Oftentimes, when we've experienced isolation or disappointment or we just don't belong, those are the times where our faith can be most rich. Having a lot oftentimes creates the illusion that we aren't dependent people. Are you looking for your faith to get you somewhere upward and inward? Or would you allow Jesus to move you outward and downward? James had to specifically talk to these early believers. Many, some of these believers had actually seen the resurrected Jesus. They had, seen, he had, they had seen the resurrected Jesus, but they were still struggling with this. Uh, he defined this issue, and the heart of this issue is this. It's favoritism. It's, it's valuing certain people over others. And listen to the way he describes it. This is, this is, this is pretty strong. He says this. He says, look. He says, have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? He, I regularly hear, I'm going to say, Christians complaining about political correctness or whatever and how people are offended by different things, right? Jesus' standards are way higher, right? You might judge somebody and they feel offended, when, when, when you judge someone and they might feel offended or that particular group might be offended by that term you used, right? When you, when you show favoritism, Jesus isn't offended. Even if you don't even say it. You know what he calls it? He calls those thoughts evil. The professor in the Ivy League school they're offended. Jesus, he calls it evil. I, I know it's like, well, well then who can, who, can, who can really stand? I mean, how, how do I handle scrolling through social media and I ignore this person, ignore this person, ignore this person, but I click on this person because in some way maybe what they're doing is interesting to me? Do I, do, am I judging then? Am I, am I showing favoritism then I, by clicking and liking these persons and not clicking and liking these persons? I'm not saying this is easy, but Jesus' standard is way higher than the most stuffy person you'd ever have around you. But here's the thing. It takes one person, just one time of feeling judged in church to say, that's okay. I, that's why I figured... I can get judged anywhere else. I can go to Twitter and get judged there. I don't need to come to, I don't need to get up, get in a car, drive to church, and then go find myself excluded somewhere there. As a church, we, we try to, we have deep value on creating safe, transforming missional environments. It's our strategy. We believe that every space, every time we gather people, it needs to be a judgment-free zone. Uh, it doesn't mean we don't challenge people. It doesn't mean we don't uh, to call people to something better. But we don't need to judge people. Uh, it needs to be a safe place. Uh, in fact, we have to grow slower because we can't just let anybody get into leadership. We need to make sure people are ready to handle that kind of uh, responsibility to care for others. 
It takes a person just one time, though, of being judged before they say, you keep church, I'm just going to hold on to Jesus. And that's the third point here. It's personal, but it's not personal. Uh, I'll, one of the things I think that has just kind of happened, and this is, this is natural, when everything changes really quickly, institutions oftentimes struggle to fail. They struggle to change. Institutions are built to keep things consistent, right? When all, the entire culture changes quickly, 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 institutions struggle to keep up. And oftentimes when they struggle to keep up and things change and different people come in, that's when the judgment begins occurring. And what happens is people say, you know what? I really like the Jesus part of Christianity, but if, if you can keep the church to yourself, that will just feel better to me because I like the Jesus side of it. The difficulty doesn't work that way. When you become united to Christ, you become united to him, you become united to his family. And because... Be united to Jesus, it's a package deal. You get, you get his brothers and sisters with you. Let's just, say, uh, let's just say me and you and my wife, let's just say Kathleen and I went to uh, uh, lunch with you at some point in time. If, you, if we were to sit there and talk and you would only talk to me and you'd only make eye contact with me, that would really bother me. This is my wife. We're like this, like... She's here too, and she really matters to me. The church is the bride of Christ. To say, I want Jesus, but like you can keep your wife to yourself, that's it's kind of deeply offensive. If I did that with you and, and, uh, and, and you wanted to introduce me to your family member and I kind of ignored them, and I said, Why well, they don't matter, I like you, that doesn't work for you. Jesus is deeply relational when it comes to the church. A lot of times what happens is uh, our world is filled with this, this, the myth of the epic romance, that there's this person that I'm going to meet someday that's going to meet all my needs, and that's going to be amazing, and we're going to get married, we're going to fall in love, and I will never feel lonely, insignificant, or inadequate ever again. And it keeps a lot of people from getting married because, well, it's a myth. But if they didn't get that on their own. Our, our world is filled with advertising, filled with the epic solution that's going to fix all of your issues, whether it's the medication or whether it's that new diet or whether it's these new clothes or new style of clothes or this new thing or this vacation. All these things are going to bring the epic solution to those epic problems. And we keep buying in because it'd be really nice to have an epic solution. But what ends up happening is uh, we, we bring that to our church and we're looking for that church filled with good-looking people that validate my pain, that agree with me on everything, and, that, and, then, uh, and, and lead me on interesting adventures that are really quite convenient for me that fit into my schedule. And we, and we wonder why we don't find it and we find church to be so disappointing because it's not, what happened to all the good-looking people, right? I, we can't, you know, we, we wonder, we, we're disappointed. Why can't church be as amazing as Target, right? Can I, can, can I return that sermon for a better one? Um, uh, this passage assumes two things. Two things are assumed in this passage. The first one is this. Everyone knows the royal law. We call maybe everyone knows the gold rule, but everyone knows that like central to following Jesus is the royal law. Central to following Jesus, like the like if you're gonna get Jesus, if you're gonna get Jesus and you're really enjoy Jesus, if if if, if you're gonna understand the fundamental basis of Christian spirituality, you're gonna get this one thing that you're supposed to love one another as yourself. And that's not just like loving your nuclear family, which actually didn't exist back then. It means loving the people who are different than you, loving the people in your church. Uh, the, other th the other assumption here is that churches were filled with rich people, middle class people, and poor people. Uh, in some ways, this passage was addressed to the middle class people. And a lot of early church history says that there's many ways middle class people is the one that built, built the church, right? And the assumption is that there's diverse 
people in the life of the church. We know that there are people of different ethnicities. The church was very diverse in the early days, uh, socioeconomically and ethnically as well. And the way God's commands are supposed to work is that it's not like God is like some kindergarten teacher trying to get control of the classroom. One or another, right? No. He's like your CrossFit instructor. And he comes up to you and says, if you want to be strong, if you want to make progress, if you really want to make progress, here's what you need to do. Start loving other people. Start loving people who are different than you. Listen to them. Don't stop complaining about people. Stop complaining in in general. Just don't complain. Complaining is going to kill your soul. Love other people. Learn to love people that are different than you. Uh, Stop envying people that have more than you. Stop envying the people that have what you want to have. Start loving them and seeing what they don't have and adding to their life there. Stop avoiding the people that have less than you. See, how, see what you can do to add to their life. Listen to how they are rich in faith. How might you become rich in faith like them? If you want to become strong, if you want to make progress, if you really want to make progress, find someone who's different than you and start loving them. It, it's hard sometimes to figure out when you're sitting in seats that are like a theater and that it's, it, it's really easy to turn church into a performance, right? You sit in seats, you enjoy the experience, and you, and you go home, right? But that's not what church was ever in the first century. It was never supposed to be that. It's an extended family. And part of being a part of that extended family is learning to love the people who are really, maybe really quite annoying to you. And who just have these opinions that are like, where do they come up with these things? But if, if you can't love them, who's in your presence, how are you going to love God who's distant? You see these things happen in places like AA. And when I, if I talk to somebody who's an alcoholic, they get this immediately. Because if you go into an AA meeting, you see the rich, the poor, the down, the out, and the up and out. It's good for your soul, but it's also good for your life. You, you might have heard of a, sort of a landmark kind of research paper that was put out about 50 years ago by a guy named Mark Granovetter. The, the, uh, the, the research was called The Strength of Weak Ties. And he's talking about relationships. Strong ties are those who are close friends and are family members that we like, right? The ones we keep close to us, and, and they give us support, and they're with us in the everyday. Uh, we see them regularly, and they, they deeply encourage us all the time. Mark Ranavetter's thesis is that the most transformative person in your life is probably not somebody with strong ties, but somebody that you have a weak tie with. A weak tie is somebody, you know their name, and you might know their occupation, but you don't know that much about them. You know them socially, and you just kind of know about their life. That's the person who's actually going to have much more uh, likelihood of bringing you a new idea, showing you a newer opportunity, or introduce you to somebody different. Those are the folks who have the greatest opportunity to, to open you up and get you to some place you would never go on your own if you just stayed among the people with your strong ties. Every single one of us has something in our pocket that all it does is build strong ties around us. There's a a whole bunch of really smart people writing algorithms so that every time you open your phone, it says, you're right, they're wrong, you're a victim, here's how you can be better at being you, and you just don't have to change. It's those people who are the problem. The algorithms are writing out of your life weak ties. And, then, and, and more and more of us are getting stuck in ghettos of thought. The church has to be and maybe the very last thing around in this world that could break us out of those ghettos of our only strong tie life. This room 
It may have somebody in it who could open up an entirely different world to you. And you may forget their name two weeks later. Underneath the entire thing, uh, James connects the thing to favoritism's twin brother, judgment. Whenever there's judgment, we're tempted to draw the line. We draw a line between the churches. We like these churches. We don't like these churches. Between political parties, the one, uh, uh, there's our party that has everything right on every single policy endeavor, and then there's the other party that's all wrong on every single one of their policy endeavors. We draw a line between us and our parents because of what they did to us. We draw a line between our spouses, right, because, well, I'm getting it right and they're not getting it right. The line of good and evil line of good and evil is not the border between Israel and Gaza. The line between good and evil is not along denominational lines. The line between good and evil is not between political parties. The line between good and evil isn't between you and your spouse or between you and the spouse that you do not have yet. It's not, the line between good and evil is not the line between you and your family member that you have beef with. As Solzhenitsyn once said, the line of separating good and evil runs not between states, classes, or political parties, but right through human hearts and every human heart. God doesn't win with judgment. And part of the entire scandal of why the church can be hurtful comes down to this whole thing. Judgment is way cleaner it's way neater. Let's get the good people in the room. Let's get the bad people out of the room. But the problem is, who gets to be in the room if the line of good and evil runs straight through every human heart? God doesn't choose to win through swift judgment. He wins through mercy. And at the heart of this passage, you see James say is, Mercy triumphs over judgment. And the difficulty of it is this. It really does come down to mercy, but mercy is messy. We all want a spirituality that looks a little bit like this. You might recognize, uh, you might recognize the Da Vinci's photo, a picture of the Lord's Supper. You can go ahead and put that up. Uh, it's nice and clean and neat. Everyone's there. And what's nice about this one is they filled in the colors, right? So it can be nice, nice and bright and happy, right? And sort of that's the spirituality that we think should be true of the church. Everyone, everyone gets enough food and everyone's well clothed and Jesus is in the center and everyone's listening to him and doing everything he says, right? Uh, more recently, a, a, an alternative version of this got put out there that you may have seen uh, that looks like this. Um, uh, not every one of those folks looks like someone that might be at your Thanksgiving table this year. But every single one of those may very well love God and know God. Um, and, and yeah, this was written for shock value, and, and, and maybe th this was exactly what it was like in the first century of those following Jesus, or maybe it was somewhere in between. But what it highlights is, is that those who get to belong to Jesus aren't the ones who get it right. It's messy. All throughout the Bible, whether it was Abraham or Moses or David or Solomon or the exile or Jesus or the church, anytime there's a renewal within God's people, it's messy. You go out through history, anytime there's a renewal or a revival, it's almost always messy. Grace is messy. The gospel is messy. The gospel doesn't say, go clean yourself up and then come to God. The gospel doesn't say, get yourself out of the depression and then come and worship. The gospel doesn't say, once you're not anxious, then, then God will listen to you. The gospel is, just says, come as you are. Come as you are. Come messy. 
in some ways, we should expect the church to be morally worse than the rest of the world. Why? Because of the people who morally need a savior are the ones who go there. Mercy is messy. It doesn't excuse when the church misbehaves. The church needs to take responsibility for what the church needs to take responsibility for. But if you're looking for a church that gets everything right and that is perfect in every way, well, this isn't your church. And I don't know if that church is out there. Because the church of Jesus Christ is a place where mercy reigns. And yes, it can be messy. Let's pray together.